So I'd want to clear up a mistake I made when I was deriving the fall velocity, sorry, the fall acceleration, which we said was this tau derivative of our fall velocity, or now just the second tau derivative of our weld line. And so just now plugging in the form of our fall velocity, we're going to see that this is going to be the gamma, sorry, the tau derivative of our four velocity vector. But now what we need to realize is that this gamma, it does somehow kind of depend on this thing, coordinate velocity. If this coordinate velocity now is not constant, i.e. it's changing with some acceleration, this gamma is also not going to be a constant. So we have to realize now that this gamma is effectively becoming a function of our coordinates because this v was a derivative. And so we can now then realize that a, such a Lorentz transformation is no longer going to be a Lorentz transformation because the, the Lorentz transformation matrix, which depends on gamma, is now going to depend on the coordinates. Right? It's not going to be a, a linear transformation where we have the derivative being zero. But now this is okay because we know that accelerated observers are going to correspond to non-inertial reference frames, i.e. reference frames that don't move with a constant velocity. And so it's perfectly valid that we can't Lorentz boost into now an accelerated reference frame because that would then be a, a non-linear transformation. And so whilst you can express these uh, acceleration components in terms of quantities that we like, like gamma and the velocity, we don't really learn too much from their form and they're just kind of needlessly complicated. It's now just kind of better to realize that this for acceleration is somehow the derivative of our fall velocity. And if our fall velocity is somehow not constant, i.e. we're not in an inertial moving reference frame, the four accelerations then going to become non-zero and we're talking about a non-inertial reference frame. But for now it's okay just to think about the acceleration in terms of the derivative of the four velocity and we're going to see we're not really ever going to use the four acceleration too much apart from really just when we define the four force and then we're just going to be able to work with the four force and just kind of forget about the four acceleration. But just to, um, just to be complete, let's say we're going to have that the four acceleration is now our second derivative of our world line. And so we can just understand it as the following vector that's kind of just giving us our second derivatives now of our coordinates. And in some sense, this is now kind of representing the, the curvature of our world line. When we start talking about general relativity, we're going to start seeing that second derivatives are quite very connected with curvature. And so one way to view the four acceleration is it's effectively measuring how curved your world line is. We're going to see that straight world lines correspond to particles that move with no fall acceleration or just a constant fall velocity. So they are unaccelerated particles that just move in inertial reference frames that have constant velocities. But now if your world line is doing something like that, it's now going to have some non-zero fall acceleration because quite clearly we can see the fall velocity vector is changing on the world line, and so hence it's for its coordinate velocity component, which I'm drawing here in red, is going to also be changing, which we then realize is acceleration. But just the key thing to note or to realize is that if you're accelerating, you're then not an inertial observer, you can't um, be transformed into a stationary reference frame using a Lorentz transformation. And now one way to realize what an accelerated observer is, 
is it's essentially somebody who is being continuously boosted to higher and higher or potentially lower velocities if they're decelerating. So that's just one kind of way that you can view an observer who is accelerating. They're just being continuously boosted to higher and higher or potentially lower coordinate velocities. And so just really quickly, let's just see how we can start rewriting these second derivatives and start massaging, introducing some gammas and v's. So I'm not going to look at the time component because it's quite hideously complicated and we never really need to worry too much about it. We do, we are interested in the time component, but only really how it appears in the full force. And when we deal with it in the full force, we're going to be dealing with it in a different way and we're never really going to need to think about this object. But just to see what this is, let's just quickly write it out. So the second tau derivative of our position x, if we remember what our first tau derivative was, we saw that the dx baby tau we could rewrite using the chain rule, which then introduces our factor gamma. And so now this second derivative we can just already write now just as our derivative gamma v. And so in the first video I just simply treated this gamma as a constant, but we now can't do that and we have to treat it as something that also depends on x and t. And so whatever this derivative is going to be, I'm just going to kind of not really worry about its value, but let's just call it d gamma by d tau. You can already then see that from the form of gamma, d gamma by d tau is going to be now the second derivative of this thing, t, which was appearing in our first component of the form acceleration. It's pretty hideous to calculate, so I'm just going to leave it for now. But then this thing is then just d gamma, and then the second or the derivative of dv by d tau. So let's just quickly work out what this dv by d tau is going to be. Again, from here, remembering that v is dx by dt, so we can realise that this is now going to become now a mixed partial derivative of x. We have our tau derivative, and then we have it being derived with respect to t. So because v is dx by dt, taking this tau derivative just produces us this mixed partial. And so now because we know these mixed partials are going to have to commute, we can take them in any order that we like. We can just first take the tau derivative and then the t derivative. So that's going to give us a d by dt of now dx by d tau, which is what we have here. So that's just going to be a, d, a d by dt of now this expression, which is, if you remember, it's gamma times v. And so we've kind of gone all the way back around and arrived at something very similar to what we had before, but just with a t here now. This is d by dt of gamma times v. And so again, we have to use the product rule, and this is just going to now give us something which I'm going to give the name gamma over dot, just to represent this t derivative. And then we're going to have a gamma times now the derivative of v, which we've said is our acceleration, reminding us that these are vector quantities. And now this is the expression for our, or just for now this piece of our um, d squared x by d tau derivative. And so if I substitute in now that this mixed partial derivative is equal to this in here, I have to rewrite it. So I have a d gamma by d tau v and then plus gamma times this thing, so gamma, gamma dot v, plus gamma squared a. So already this is starting to look pretty hideous and we're not really learning anything too much more from writing all these terms out, we're just 
getting more and more needlessly complicated. And so really just don't worry too much about what the four acceleration components are, what they look like. It's better just to understand them conceptually. It's just now the second tau derivative of the weld line. And so we're going to see that when we start working with four forces, we're going to not need to even bother with any of this and we're just going to have to talk purely in terms of forces rather than dealing with these kind of complicated big expressions that have lots of different derivatives going on and it just becomes quite a mess to deal with.